College of Pharmacy brings in a world-renowned speaker, um, it's a topic expert to come uh, educate us on a topic that the students selected uh, last spring. Um, and so uh, Dean Speedy uh, was able to contact her good friend, uh, Dr. Paige Clark here uh, to, from Oregon. Um, and so she'll be talking today um, about that issue. Um, so real quick, I just want to read Paige's uh, biography for you. Okay, so uh, Paige Clark is the Director of the Alumni Relations and Professional Development uh, for Oregon State University College of Pharmacy. Uh, in this role, she creates professional development opportunities for students and alumni, directs alumni outreach activities, and manages the enrichment, ceremonial events, and continuing education endeavors for the college. Paige is a graduate of Oregon State University College of Pharmacy and is an active participant in Oregon's Pharmacy Coalition, the state association uh, managed body that directs pharmacy legislative engagement. In Paige's former position as staff pharmacist consultant for the Oregon Board of Pharmacy, she authored policy, managed focus groups, crafted statute and rule language, provided research, and assisted the board in legislative endeavors. Some of the prominent projects that Paige has engaged in have been the development of Oregon's conscious clause related to Oregon's death with dignity law, uh, passage of Oregon's PDMP law, and implementation of Oregon's BC prescribing law, the first fully implemented independent prescribing, non-protocol prescribing law in the nation. She's also served on the governor-appointed death with dignity task force, uh, led the lobby effort for the passage of Oregon's PDMP law and created uh, that has been centrally involved in Oregon's legislative process for three decades. Um, in her career, Paige has worked in retail and community pharmacy practice and in long-term care pharmacy as a clinical consultant pharmacist and also as the director of education for IPAC Pharmacy, running a national training program for um, pharma sales and executive teams. Paige has also been honored as Oregon's Pharmacist of the Year in 1997 she received the APHA National Merit Award from the Academy of Pharmacy Practice and Management in 1989 and was the uh, Value Right National Awardee in 1990. She has served on APHA's media committee, um, several national advisory committees, and two statewide governor appointed committees in Oregon. Paige was named the National Good Government Pharmacist of the Year in 2000 by the American Pharmacists Association, and she was awarded the Bull of Hygieia in 2011. Uh, most recently, she was honored as a, for a second time as Oregon's 2016 Pharmacist of the Year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in, join me in welcoming Paige uh, to, as our speaker nice. today. You. I didn't realize he was going to read all that. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Oh, yeah, many accomplishments. Nice. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you live long enough, that's kind of what happens there, really, really and truly. Hi to the other room. Oh, my gosh. I can sort of see you there. That's really fun. Um, you know, it's. I, I told the group of students um, that we got to have dinner last night and and um, and everyone yesterday. Really, there comes a time in your every single one of your um, careers, really truly, that um, you will be faced with or provided with is maybe a nicer way to put that an opportunity that is really going to be uh, impactful of of the whole career. And so the very first thing that I really want to say to you is when that happens, what happened to me, uh, lean in, as they say, because um, it really benefits certainly not only you as a professional, but your entire profession. And that's really the story that I'm here to tell you today um, in a very complicated and very um, uh, challenging issue that came forth in Oregon. And I've actually got some notes I'm going to go through. Don't worry, not all these are notes um, with you. And then we're going to kind of transition to really having some conversation. And, and I'd really like to share with you lessons learned that can be applied to a variety of different uh, challenging issues that face our profession. So um, with that, again, thank you for the nice introduction. That was, that was really lovely. And I must say, the alumni director in me requires that I stand up in front of you all and say how incredible that in your pharmacy family, you have an ancestor, Mr. Melendi, who thought enough of all of you that would come after him to endow the opportunity for students to bring a speaker that you select every year. It's remarkable. It says a lot about who your pharmacy family is. So um, uh, Dean Speedy was just sort of chuckling yesterday when I said, please pay it forward when you have the chance to do so for all of those that come after you as well. This says everything about, about who you are as a pharmacy family here. I'm very impressed. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's really a delight. Um, mentoring and offering perspectives that, that those of us that have been around for several decades can share with you is so important because you know, this profession has had a very interesting um, history, and, and I can't believe my children who are 
ish your age is laugh at me because it's true you get to a point and you you really feel compelled to say let me tell you about when and 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 there are a few moments in time that have been very very transformative in in our profession and that's that's really kind of the theme of what i'm saying to all of you here today understand that um my favorite mentor, George Girding, dear, dear gentleman in this profession, um, who I tease George. I'm like, you were old when I was young. So, you know, just saying. Um, George tells me the story, and I, and I had trouble really internalizing this at first, but as a young practitioner, George was in a situation where he was not allowed to put the name of the prescription on the medication when he dispensed it. Uh, can you believe that? To where, to where I practice pharmacy and where you all are practicing pharmacy in one professional lifetime. I mean, that's really remarkable. And that is kind of the beginning of this story because um, I was a young pharmacist. Um, I, had, uh, I was actually pregnant at the time, so picture this. And um, we, had, we had some sort of elder gentlemen that were running the profession at that time that sort of threw me into this legislative um, component and said, oh, yeah, 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 send her in there. It'll, it'll, it'll be fine, thinking maybe she really won't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Lean in, people. Lean in. Because there, is, there will be a moment in time for all of you that whatever you bring forth matters. It really does. So um, really, that's, that's why I was so, it was so appealing to come here and talk to you. I will tell you, um, I don't think I told anybody this until dinner last night. I've never been outside of the state of Oregon talking about this issue um, because it is, it is a difficult um, issue for many to, to, to sort of circle around as a profession. But you certainly are uh, at the place where you're looking at many of these issues here. So it's, it's nice to, to be able to be here with you uh, and, and share my story. Um, implementing Oregon's death with dignity law, really there are a variety of different aspects to this. And um, so we will sort of delve right into ethics, policies, and the pharmacist's role in self-determined end of life. And, and it's really important to consider that self-determined component. This was the first time that pharmacists absolutely found themselves at the nexus, and I really mean that, of controversy on a national and an international level. Um, this is where the rubber meets the road for many people in deciding um, personally, professionally, ethically, morally, et cetera, um, really where they, where they stand. And the, the concept of a conscience clause, which is what we're really going to focus on today, was non-existent or nearly non-existent at that point. Um, you know, again, back to my friend George Girding, who tells me, you know, dispensing the pill, certainly there were moments in time when maybe that was a little bit, uh, you know, conversational within the community, but nothing like a death with dignity, uh, professional conversation that had to take place as well. So um, when I say necessary pioneers, that's what I mean. Um, and I'm gonna go through the specifics of this to sort of share with you um, this divisive and challenging issue and really how it came about. Um, many professionals had concerns, as you can imagine, about their professional board's interpretation of professional misconduct, uh, censure, loss of licensure, uh, being perhaps blackballed by employer, employer groups, professional associations, being the target of media. Ever been on Good Morning America? Um, there were extensive heated and complex conversations that involved individual morality in, inside each of us, ethical and professional issues, religious, medical, human rights, legal leaders from around the world descended upon Oregon um, and from everywhere. From the Netherlands, they came with a certain perspective and a certain approach and a certain background. Um, um, from the uh, hierarchy of the Catholic Church, um, came in large, large numbers. Um, we had a governor at the time who was a physician, and that's why some of this came about. Um, he was a very, very popular two-term governor uh, and felt very strongly about patients being able to self-direct um, many of the components of their health care. So when I say necessary pioneers, I'm going to run you through exactly what happened here. 
I'm sure you can Google all this history, but let me just run you through the short version. So Oregon voters ultimately were exceptionally clear in their direction um, to make death with dignity legal in Oregon. First, with the passage of Measure 16. I'm sure that's what some of you would, would think of this as. It was very much in the media. That became law in 1994, passed by 51.3% in Oregon, right in the middle, right? That's how divisive this was. And subsequently passing a second time into law in effect in 1997 via Measure 51, which was referred in the wake of an attempt to repeal the Death with Dignity Act, but was rejected by 60% of Oregon voters, right? Don't be telling me you're going to repeal this, folks. I already voted it in. 60% said that. So we're upping the ante here of the um, uh, level of support, conversation, and engagement by Oregon citizens and the Oregon legislature. Um, the act was challenged by the G.W. Bush administration, was upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States during Gonzalez versus Oregon in 2006, worth reading. Um, after all the legal, legislative, and political maneuvers, ultimately our entire healthcare community was directed to implement this law. Okay, right here, I just want to say, really, truly, understand who really runs our profession. The answer is your legislature. They build statute that determines what your scope of practice is. They represent the citizens of your state and you must practice pharmacy based on what your legislature does. The single most important day you have is legislative day in my opinion in, in the College of Pharmacy, really truly. And we are all raising another generation behind us that absolutely understands that. Yes, your board of pharmacy, of course, every rule, right? Every regulation ties back to a statute. Straight line, not a dotted line, straight line, right? So a lot of us think, oh, the Board of Pharmacy, the Board of Pharmacy disciplines you, that is true, and the Board of Pharmacy guides you, but it is your state legislature that determines how you will practice pharmacy in your state, right? So that's why I tell you that. When I say we were necessary pioneers, that is what I mean. We were, oops, point over here, there we go implementing the nation's first death with dignity law because we were directed to do so by the state of Oregon. Flat out the governor who directs and uh, the board of pharmacy, right? There's that whole piece. Um, the director appoints the board members. So that's, again, you got a lot of people telling you we have voted, it's gone through the courts, it's done all the craziness, it's come back and now we voted at 60% implement profession of pharmacy, right? So, um, the Oregon Board of Pharmacy then had to really grapple with many issues, including wading into the ethical landscape, different from the moral piece, the ethical landscape, of putting words and direction into a conscience clause um, to enable pharmacists to step away from a prescription. Here's what happened. It was fascinating to me, as a, again, a young pharmacist through this, to realize that um, those, uh, and believe me, I have, many, I have many physician friends. I'm fond of them all. However, they walked into that room, slammed this down and said, why do we even have pharmacists in this task force, in this room? At this point, we were not invited onto the task force. That pharmacist will fill whatever is put in front of them and that is the way this is. As I tiptoe into the room and I'm like, with all due respect, <laughs> yeah. That was the transformative moment in our profession when media, John London, <laughs> when, when media, when um, uh, our allied healthcare professionals understood that we are a partner in this, we have a role to play in this. And in fact, folks, we sit right in the middle of it, right? You could have physicians doing all of this over here, that's great. How is it you think you're going to get these prescriptions filled? Hello? And how are you going to have a successful outcome for your patient over here without these amazing professionals in the middle? So that whole piece was what was rolling through all of this. And all of, over the top of this, you've got politics, big, heavy, deep, international, rough politics, right? And two of us in the middle of it going, okay. So um, again, lean in. You are all very, very capable of doing absolutely everything that we've done here. This was transformative, absolutely transformative because outside of our profession, so many people were looking at us, evaluating how we did this, et cetera. And so um, it really was about as a profession, being directed to do this by the citizens of Oregon, how are you going to do this? So now we're going to really talk about some specifics here, um, some general terms. 
physician assisted suicide. Um, I have to say from Oregon, I'm real uncomfortable with that term. I really am comfortable with death with dignity. It's how I came to this. It's how I came to understand this. Um, finally, when, um, you know, the, <laughs> I was just getting beaten about the heads and sh head and shoulders by everybody political in the room. I mean, I'm a, a pharmacist. Yeah, I've got some political background, but seriously, these are big players. Finally, the governor looked at them all and said, get out of the room. And I, I said, you know, governor, please, I, can you bring me the patient advocate? I, I need to... This is how pharmacy looks at this as a patient advocate. And so cleared the room of all the craziness, brought in the patient advocates and, and to hear their stories. Fascinating. And it, and it does, it, it's very compelling in many, many cases. Um, so that term uh, really is broad and it refers to a lot of things, to a lot of people. Um, whoops, keep pointing the wrong way. Uh, medical aid in dying is a term that, that others are more comfortable with. They tended to adopt this in California, for example. Medical aid in dying is a little more descriptive. Um, because, and we'll talk about why. Oops. Death with dignity. So there you go. Um, so in death with dignity, this is the cornerstone and what we had such a great conversation about yesterday, that it is patient self-administered end-of-life medication. self administered. We're going to talk a lot about that. So what is medical aid in dying in general? Also known as death with dignity, again, medical practice, which allows the following things. A terminally ill, we'll talk about that, mentally capable. This became such an important point as people were coming at us because this is not a lot of things. This is not the slippery slope the way this is built. This is not mentally incapable people being in any way um, sent down this path. It's quite simply not. Six months left to, li left to live, document, we'll, we'll talk about the physician components in that. It's their ability to request and obtain from their doctor to self-administer medications that bring about a peaceful death um, should their suffering become unbearable. Euthanasia, absolutely not. That's not what this is about in any way, shape, or form. Um, that, is, that is not what this is. Um, again, in death of dignity, a physician, physician um, prescribes and the pharmacist, sometimes compounds, sometimes dispenses, depending on what we're talking about, a lethal dose of medication um, that the patient can have at their, at their disposal. Um, the patient not a care provider in any way, shape, or form, administers the medication. Um, and again, uh, euthanasia illegal in every state, including in Oregon. Click, there we go. So uh, some other terms that, that you probably as students are all familiar with, for sure. These are very common sort of medical terms. The double effect, um, medication, narcotics, that sort of thing, prescribed to, of course, alleviate pain. Um, and, and of course, they have the secondary component of decreasing respiration. But it can go a very, 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 very long time, right? Yeah. Um, and terminal sedation, also a term um, when particularly barbitur barbiturates are, are used to induce a coma. Again, medically managed, uh, certainly usually in a particular environment, um, can go a very long time as well. Um, so here are some of the aspects of having a death with dignity law in place. Um, Oregon's Department of Health reports since 1997, that's the magic year, right, um, that, that uh, really conversations in medical aid and dying has they truly believe in encouraged communication of end-of-life issues. These are hard issues for family members to discuss with loved ones that they are ultimately going to lose. And it's, it's interesting. There are, um, there are studies underway. There are a lot of anecdotal things about this as well. And um, it, it may be that this really encourages um, really productive and, and useful conversations to take place. Um, hospice use, palliative care, through the roof in Oregon, through the roof. There are people that would really like to think that because of this law being in place and implemented, that really, truly, everything else has, has risen as well. Anecdotally, I truly believe that. I do. We have got an incredibly robust and, and loving hospice system that is in place in our state. Um, and there's certainly research, uh, you know, there are numbers and that sort of thing uh, out there as well. 
Um, we are said to have the highest at home death rate, um, which I think is, is worthy of noting as well. Let's move to the pharmacist role. So here's our view. <laughs> um, roles and responsibilities, the conscience clause. This is where I really want to stop. I brought you handouts on this, and it is worthy of going through this line by line, and I'll tell you why. This is why I'm here to talk to you today. It really is. This is the cornerstone of provision of, of something that is complicated, that is um, policy driven, that is highly charged. And we as a whole collective profession needed to implement this. Individually, we need to protect each and every one of us for stepping away or stepping in, either one. So we're gonna go line by line. No provision, and, and understand, this was groundbreaking, groundbreaking wording to have go across the nation, really, truly. No provision exists within Oregon pharmacy laws or regulations that require a pharmacist to dispense every lawful prescription presented in a pharmacy, period. Sentence one. That said a lot to a lot of people. Our colleagues, physicians, practitioners, there was tremendous pushback on that first sentence, and we stood firm and said, that is the way this is. That is our profession. It is who we are. Indeed, pharmacy laws and regulations require a pharmacist to delay the, the dispensing of a prescription when faced with questions of potential harm to a patient or concerns of clinical appropriateness of a drug, dose, or dosage form for a particular patient. You do not just put a prescription in front of me and tell me, fill that. Not anymore. Pharmacists are required to seek clarification prior to dispensing and to collaborate with prescribing practitioners in the patient's best interest of whatever that outcome is. Just as other healthcare professionals and practitioners in Oregon have a choice, so do pharmacists have a choice, whether or not to participate in activities they find morally or ethically objectionable. That was literally a fight we had. It was weeks on end of a fight about this, really and truly. Um, Oregon pharmacists cannot, however, as we go on to say in the next sentence, interfere with the patient's lawfully and appropriately prescribed drug therapy we added drugs and devices a little later in 2007. That's another story. Pharmacists enter into relationships with patients in the daily course of normal pharmacy practice. Within these relationships, pharmacists have a duty to provide professional pharmaceutical care in the patient's interest. Now we go to the next paragraph. The Board of Pharmacy expects each Oregon pharmacist in charge, we have a PIC, everybody calls it something slightly different, to adopt written policies and procedures that address the issues of pharmacists' moral, ethical, and professional responsibilities. It's the board's belief that pharmacy policies and procedures could allow a pharmacist to exercise his or her choice not to participate, and at the same time, not interfere with the patient's right to receive appropriate lawfully prescribed drug therapy or drugs, devices, blah, blah, blah. These may include dispensing the prescription or drug or device by another pharmacist on site or arranging for the prescription to be dispensed by a pharmacist at another site. The board also expects Oregon pharmacies to discuss issues of moral, ethical, and professional responsibilities with their PIC and to understand and comply with the pharmacy's policies and procedures. So what's interesting so far about what I've told you is you've seen what we've done. We've built, we got right out there in front of everybody and said, this is true. And then we built from there down, right? And understand that many boards of pharmacy choose not to communicate with their licensees in great detail like this. Policies and procedures that are up on the website uh, are, are perhaps more common now than they used to be. They used to not be common. It was like you had statute and you had rule. You figure it out and then we'll fine you on the backside, right? I, not, not in Oregon, that's really not how our board operates, but, but some boards, right? This is a total turn. This is explaining to you specifically what we expect from you, what your rights are as an individual, and we're going to go into great detail that was our that was really our only choice in this to speak to all the the licensees and practitioners in the state the board expects that pharmacy policies and procedures will ensure patients in oregon always receive appropriate and lawfully prescribed medications and information or drugs devices blah 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 uh, in a timely and professional manner and that patients are not burdened by the pharmacist's individual beliefs. Interference with the patient's right to receive timely professional prescription services and information or drugs and devices, blah, 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 um, could result in disciplinary, disciplinary action by the board. Furthermore, then we had to go on. A few years later, we found that we had to add this piece for 
Clarification is the, the polite word to say about this. Let's go through this. For example, in case we weren't clear enough to begin with, the board would consider it unprofessional conduct for a pharmacist to lecture a patient about the pharmacist's moral or religious beliefs, to violate the patient's privacy, or to destroy, confiscate, or otherwise tamper with the patient's prescription. The written policy should require an objecting pharmacist to inform the PIC in advance so that the PIC can reasonably accommodate that objection before a patient presents a prescription or makes requests for drugs and devices, blah, blah, blah. Um, the accommodation may not include permission to lecture the patient. The policy should also ensure that the patient's prescription or drug device are met by either ordering the drug. You can't just go, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have it, we don't have it. Nope. Uh, by transferring or returning the prescription to the patient if the patient requests, or by referring the patient to another pharmacy nearby where the patient can get the prescription filled or receive drugs and devices, blah, blah, blah. In the event of referral, the pharmacist is responsible for identifying another pharmacy that has the medication in stock and will dispense the prescription or drugs and devices, blah, blah, blah. Etc. And then it goes on finally to follow up with that and say pharmacists licensed in Oregon may seek clarification directly from the board and patients who have issues can you know click on a link and, and go through that. So that is the cornerstone of really how this works. And so again, we were mandated to implement as a profession. Like everything I will tell you, we have a we have a bell curve. We've got folks over here who are like, yeah, I'm on it, I got it, I got it. And you have to respect that. You have people over here who are like, there is no way. Great, one of my best friends sits here. No lie, one of my best friends sits here. Majority of the pharmacists, truly the majority of the pharmacists in Oregon, I will say, are right in the middle. And I had the most fascinating conversation before coming to see you. I called around a couple of friends that, that I know, you know are either here or here or in the middle. And um, one of them, who I hadn't talked to in years actually, and, and she's one of my alums, so I like took her some orange things and said, hey, Let's go to lunch, talk, let's talk about this. And she, um, in a very moving manner, told me the story about, um, and she didn't have to tell me this, but uh, her personal situation where she's sort of been sitting in the middle, there was a dear, dear patient of hers who she knew all of the particulars and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and she did participate in this. And again, um, you know, I, I um, um, was really moved by her personal professional story in this was, was very interesting. So let's talk about the death of dignity requirements. This is important as it all ties in. In order to, retain a, uh, to obtain a prescription in Oregon, number one, patient must be over 18 years old. Check, that's easy. Number two, the patient must be a resident of Oregon. That's not, that's not uh, spelled out in statute, nor is it in rule for the physicians. That is a professional um, decision. Um, and, you know, do you have a driver's license? Do you, you know, things like that are often documented and used, I'm positive. The patient must be capable. They, um, they have to make and communicate their own health care decisions. Uh, patient must have a terminal illness with less than six months to live. The request for a lethal prescription must be voluntary. Patient meeting these requirements must <clears throat> make one written which two witnesses sign, and two verbal requests to his or her physician. Verbal requests must be 15 days apart. To go on, the prescribing physician and the consultant physician are required to confirm diagnosis and prognosis. Determine the patient's capable of acting voluntarily. Refer the patient to counseling if they think there's any evidence of um, psychological, psychiatric, etc. That happens, by the way. Uh, that they are referred. We've seen that happen. And then the prescribing physician must also inform the patient of feasible alternatives, comfort care, hospice care, pain control options. Again, we've seen a huge rise in um, recognition of that among family members, among patients. All these resources have been brought to bear. Um, that's been really wonderful to see. Legal protection. Patients and all providers who adhere to the requirements of this act very, very firm requirements of this act, right? I've showed you, shown you exactly where these bumpers are. I've shown you what it is not. Um, protected from criminal, criminal prosecution. The law specifically prohibits euthanasia and providers can absolutely not administer these lethal medications. 
to be in compliance, healthcare providers are required to report the writing of all these prescriptions um, for lethal medications by either completing a set of forms, which I brought a couple here to share with you. Here are the pharmacist specific roles. Required record keeping. We're all about our records, right? As we should be. Um, and there's a whole piece there. Here is the single form, which I think I brought you, the single form that is required, which as you can see, focuses on the medications, et cetera. Um, and we can talk about numbers and things in a little bit. It would probably surprise you to know how few of these are go through this process and are filled and how few are taken. It's, it's surprising. So employer notification, again, we talked about that. It ties back to the conscience clause here. You, you as an Oregon pharmacist, um, if you go to work for an employer, you are going to have that conversation with that employer. Everybody's working together here. We want that patient taken care of. We want to allow you as an individual to step away if you choose to do that. That's how this all works. There's no ability, again, to lecture uh, or block the patient from receipt of this prescription. Um, professional conduct would be in question there. If you're refusing, you must facilitate patient referral to do a dispensing pharmacy via policies set forth in your pre-planned guidelines. So that's policy, right? That's not rule, that's not statute, it's policy, which means that an employer can set up what that policy looks like with all of you who are employed there. It might be that you have a lead technician step in and say, um, it, it may be that they say, I'm so sorry, we, we just need a, few, a little time to, to take care of this for you. It may be that another pharmacist comes in. It may be that, that um, we've called that to the pharmacy down the street and across the way. They're waiting for you. It will be filled by the time you're there. It could be all of these things. It could be a lot of different things. Um, I've, I've seen policies and procedures and every uh, permutation of that that you can possibly imagine for sure. Some pharmacologic considerations, of course, our world. Um, there are specific useful and necessary things that obviously you, you um, do, and uh, Dean Speedy stopped me and asked me this yesterday, so I will say it is, it is interesting that um, in Oregon we have um, our language is written that you either counsel the patient or the agent of the patient. So it could be that you are working directly with a family member, uh, quite possible um, that that would be the case. Some things to ponder. Um, I'm told, I dug and dug and dug, but I'm told you don't really have a robust conscience clause. I know that you have a piece of legislation sitting here that is attempting to move its way through. I literally am begging you, you've got to have a conscience clause because the key is every individual has the ability to step away or to step in and have full protection around you and have the entire profession come together and provide this um, if this passes for your for your patients. Protecting the reported data, number two, singularly important, absolutely. Um, there is no list of here are the pharmacists that do this, here are the pharmacists that don't, absolutely not. We had been through the big jets flying into Oregon and, and the craziness that comes with that. No one wants that in our profession, no one. And so um, there is a volunteer group called Compassion and Care. They're in a, chapters in a variety of states. They have a, a real, um, uh, desire to protect uh, the professionals who, who maybe choose to do that. I know that, um, so example, if a phone call comes into the Oregon Health Authority, our, our sort of, you know, government agency, they will provide that number and they can sort of go from there. The thing that I wanted to tell you is we have only twice that I have known of, and usually somehow or other my phone rings, usually because of this, um, in all this time, only two times has a physician sort of, <laughs> craziness, written a prescription and handed it to a poor patient who walked into a pharmacy unknowingly. That is not, 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 not how this works at all. Um, we uh, never want pharmacies or pharmacists um, surprised, shocked, or otherwise. We have all these things in place. We do in case that ever happens. But really, truly, that is not how this happens. There is generally the compassion and care folks and, and the physician, and that physician knows to reach out to a pharmacist. Maybe it's a compounding pharmacist, maybe it's a pharmacist. One of the gals who's very, very forthright and public about this works for Kaiser Permanente in Oregon. And, and she is has always been a hospice sort of based person and very, very supportive of end of life issues, et cetera. And, and she has been very uh, helpful as well. Again, developing those policies and procedures at employers, those are very important. So conscience clause, 
protect your reported data, absolutely require that. Um, facilitate those meaningful professional discussions among these folks and respecting everyone from where they come to this and then developing the employer policies and procedures. Outcomes for the profession, you know, uh, you go through the ringer and you come out the other side of this and there really were positive um, components for our profession. We were, we went from, I mean, really went from completely in my world being disrespected about the uh, being in the middle of all this and, the, and professionally um, not even being really taken seriously for everything that you need to do to care for a patient to literally being uh, fully incorporated into this policy literally all the way through. It was transformative. It was one of those moments in time you look back and you go, wow, look at that, okay. Um, and that rolled into APHA. We wrote a, um, a policy position uh, paper for them and, and did a, a lot of work nationwide for that as well. Um, and it has, it has shown itself in Oregon with our bill sponsors, our legislators, and everyone that came after that. Um, and, and I would like to think that's why we maybe have some voice, that we have some involvement in um, in a lot of different um, medically managed issues in Oregon. Um, it became clear that pharmacists really no longer filled those prescriptions and were just put blindly in front of them, et cetera. Um, and that we were absolutely imperative in, in providing whatever the um, successful outcome needed to be. So um, again, just to review this, pharmacists are informed. That was the cornerstone, point number one that we had to argue. You need to inform me. You're not gonna just, that's not gonna happen, right? Number two, we have the ability to opt out. And that piece of conversation, I, I know it's probably hard for your generation of pharmacists to understand that, was groundbreaking. It was groundbreaking, really truly was. Um, legal protection for everyone who participates, specific prohibition on censoring or firing professionals who, who participate, privacy of state records, and assurance, again, from the State Board of Pharmacy and from the statute language, making it very clear that uh, no professional is required to participate. So I say thank you to you. Um, I would love to answer questions um, and really um, see what I can do to help you with any issues. If somebody can help me with the other room, if they have questions in there, I can, maybe it's my eyes, I don't know, but wave your arms if you have a question. Okay, so let's really talk. Ask me anything. The doors are closed. We have no legislators in here, right? Right? Yes, yes. What if it failed to bring uh, about the uh, intended mm -hmm. result, mm -hmm. one? And number two, mm -hmm. what if you're the pharmacist and you're getting a second prescription for the same person? Uh, never heard of that happening. Uh, they would have to go through the entire process. And, um, yeah, uh, failing has happened this many times, documented in, uh, in public reports. Um, and by failing, they mean, it, so it's interesting. Let's look at some numbers. Um, there are a number of ways that's handled. Um, the physician generally uh, asks the family and the patient to discuss a contingency plan. Um, you have to, you have to uh, ingest this within two minutes. You have to, I mean, you know, self-administered, we're talking a straw, feeding tube, plunger, they have to do that themselves. Um, so there is, before you get to that point, there is so much that goes on here in planning and good, solid conversation that happens. Um, there will then be a contingency plan in place. If emergency, you know, EMT, anyone's involved, um, what are they going to do? Make the patient comfortable, put them into a coma state. I know that that's what happened in these two cases. Um, so um, it is, that is why it is imperative that a pharmacist be very, very centrally involved in the outcome of this. Um, let's see, where's my cell phone? I have numbers on here to pull up for you guys, um, which was very funny yesterday because in your beautiful, um, uh, uh, what is that, beautiful room, I didn't have any cell reception and you know, we're so like, electro, I'm like, I can't pull it up, but I have it here for you somewhere. Oh, ooh, I only have one. Sorry. Um, so the numbers are roughly like this. I can't remember the exact numbers, but like, uh, in all these years, there have been like 1,300 prescriptions written all these years. And maybe 
oh, I hope I remember this number right, 902 maybe ingested, right? Sometimes, and this is what I heard from those patients that, or the patient advocates, that to them it was um, control of the final passing. And you and I as pharmacists think, is it the pain? Because we can help you with the pain, right? We're all about that. It really was more, as I listened to them, it was really more about them um, wanting their family to have peaceful passing of this person. Does that make sense? It, it can be not a, not a peaceful passing. Uh, most of these patients, again, I wish I had Sorry, but um, you can go on and Google and all the reports are there, but the vast majority are uh, cancer patients. There are certainly some ALS patients. That gets a little tricky for sure, as you can imagine with the decline. You, you have to have enough personal wherewithal to self-administer, right? And you don't want your patient to miss that window, but you don't want to lose day, precious days with your family. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real, um, it's a, that's why the pharmacist, and the physician are teamed at the center of this in a way that I, I just can't even tell you, it's, it's unbelievable, it really is. So does that help? Kind of, yeah, yeah, good. Okay, other questions? Yes. Are there any conversations about um, adapting the law so that people who are not physically capable of self-administering could be helped by this law? I'm going to say no because of everything we, that's why I look like this, everything we've been through in Oregon. Um, I, this works for what it is intended to do, which is empower a patient who chooses to have that final decision of their own. Um, and the trick to your point is great teamwork in the middle of this to get that patient the outcome they really want. I would not say that there are not people out there floating. Sure, there are people here. Believe me, there are people here. I just ignore all that noise because as a profession, we serve our patients. And I just, we all, we literally circled the wagons and that's where we really have come to. So are there probably, I mean, you know, craziness spins out there everywhere. Just ignore it all. Focus on, you know, provision to the patient is really my best answer there. I mean, again, you know, we literally had like the nether. I mean, literally, people flew in from everywhere, and they're like, "Oh, we're going to do this in the United States." We're like, "Back up!" <laughs> First off, we're pharmacy, and we're here to stay. So, you know, y'all just we're going to have a different conversation. Was step one. So, you know, I think there are, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere. This works. The reports that you can read will will bear that out. In and that's what the citizens of Oregon wanted. You let me have a choice. And, and again, many people will, will um, the prescription will even be written and not filled because we're talking like $3,000, right? Spendy, yeah. And, um, and that can be a barrier. Somebody yesterday asked me about uh, third-party payers. What's fascinating is that some of them will say absolutely under no circumstances will that be covered, like in rider, okay. Others will say absolutely this is covered in rider. Okay, <laughs> you know, um, and and others, um, there is an organization that I think tries to assist with someone that literally does not have the wherewithal to make that purchase choice. Another question yesterday was, what about um, disposal? If folks, you know, if it's a cancer patient, you've ever been out into their home, you got stacks and piles and this is just one more. Folks. And so obviously, yes, we have had even even more um, uh, substantive conversations with our um, cancer patients, end of life issues and proper disposal. You know, the kitty litter flushing, whatever. No, let's get it into the sheriff's department and get it properly out of everyone, you know, disposed of and incinerated and all those good things. So it's helped those conversations in Oregon, I think, um, for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So. I was curious, what if the public and other interest groups began demanding that pharmacist names went on record? Absolutely not going to happen in Oregon. As they've done with the death penalty provision of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Education. We will have a hell of a fight on our hands then. Telling you what, I've grown up a lot. <laughs> and you know, we're, 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 we cannot have that. And there are, there, I, I believe there are enough people on the other end of that issue that will absolutely fight to ensure that will never happen. I do understand what you're saying. I really do. Uh, it's, it's been fascinating to me to watch the um, death penalty situation and, and all of that. And, and this, again, again, to your point, what we're talking about here with these bright lines in this box is a very specific patient-centered thing. It is not what a lot of people think it is. It's just not. Um, and, and that whole big, huge conversation that goes on out here, it's like, ah, I fought my battle and I'm in this box. So, yeah. I, I do, I, Oregon will, I would, I would really say Oregon will not allow that to happen, really, truly. I don't know enough about the politics on the ground here in your state yet to understand that, but um, you know, I'll be talking with your legislative committee tomorrow, which will be great. So, yeah, good, good questions. Everything else you want to know? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we've talked a lot about the groundwork that has to be laid, and I'm wondering if there's any way to kind of start that before that final requirement of a six-month prognosis with a terminal illness is actually determined. There's Can not. You kind of, okay, so it has to start. The gentleman in the back who asked me that question, again, very carefully construct, and there was conversation about that, too, and, and that sort of answers your question, too. Absolutely none of that happens until the six-month prognosis. Now, will patients ask? to someone's point in here, you know, patient directed, sure. Medical providers will say, we're not there. That's this line in the sand. We are not there. So we're gonna do everything we can to get you through chemo, 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 or whatever we're doing, right? We're gonna save that person. Mm -hmm. So my quick follow-up then would be, what does the timeline look like for somebody who decides to, to choose this, this mm -hmm. pathway? Um, mm -hmm. Like how long, what's mm -hmm. the timeline look like? 15 day between the two and uh, two written, and uh, you know, th th there's a lot involved. The f fastest would probably be um, maybe 20 days, maybe okay. 20 Thank days. You. Yeah, yeah. So you could go, 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 and go, uh, something could happen, you know, kidney failure, I mean, something happened and you're like, we can't, we can't pull you out of this. And I'm sure that's where many of those conversations really happen, you know. Just curious, it's, it's rare enough that a pharmacist is not going to be, uh, it's, it's not going to be a common occurrence no. for pharmacists. So it's so it rare that I'm just wondering about pharmacists that if, you, if there's been conversations among pharmacists about how how this, how they f feel about this or how this rolls out or or if, it, if they're presented with an, uh, an order for this, is, is it suddenly stopped? I mean, because it's very different than, okay, we've got hypertension. I'm going to kind of, do you oh, understand your hypertension? Right. This is where Lipids. the rubber meets the road. So, uh, oh, now we have a death with, with dignity. Right. It's very different. So how, right. just, just from pharmacist comments, I, I'm mm -hmm. curious, mm -hmm. have you heard back from? So, um, my opinion. I know a lot of the pharmacists in Oregon. It's my job. I'm the alumni director. We're the biggest program. Um, some of the people who have participated in this, who choose to, I don't ask, who cho who's choose, chosen to tell me, they really surprise me. Um, are you asking me, is anyone uncomfortable with that choice? Just is wondering about the overall, just the impression that as you're working along, you're busy, and you, you, you're presented with this order. Uh -huh. and it, to to my rare. point, it, to, and to your point, that is not the way this works. There have been this many in since 1994 where a stupid physician, one of them likes to lobby in the legislature. I'm telling you, that man walks in that building, I'm on his heels. It is just that bad. So there, there It does not happen that way. There is conversation. There is, again, you've got all these days happening. Of, of require and 15 days between and what do you know what I mean for them to connect with a pharmacist gotcha does that work it does okay yeah 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 that's a great question somebody else had a yeah so you had, you had kind of mentioned you know organizations having a you know a say in this and a role in this a volunteer organization that is very um, engaged in end-of-life issues yes what, um, and then you mentioned, you talked a little bit about chain pharmacies, you know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we see situations like this. Right now, we have a pretty cool medical marijuana system in Minnesota, but 
physicians in large organizations are often like discouraged from participating right. or barred from employers can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, what does that kind of look like with your chain pharmacies mm -hmm. and uh, with like who kind of are the pharmacists if we had to have a picture yeah. of yeah. pharmacists doing this? Well, one of the reasons I threw Kaiser out there because most people go, oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And she stands up in front of everybody. She'll come and talk to you about whatever and whenever. She really, um, you know, she's been a kind of a hospice specialty pharmacist for almost her entire career. And um, she was one of the people originally going, what are we doing? And has really come to realize the power for her own patients. So anyone can say we're not participating. Any entity can say that, of course. Um, chain pharmacies, uh, by policy and procedure, and I've seen most of them, uh, tend to allow a pharmacist to participate or not. Understand though, you got to get your hands on 100 seco for compounding pharmacists. Then, if they do choose to compound this, yes. how does that work for like their compounding documentation? Because obviously, you have to like sign off on any compounding documentation, right? That you do. Uh, they would literally uh, probably attach. I think Tom probably attaches something to this. You can list the medications here and and um, for your record keeping purposes. Is that what you're asking me? Well, as far as like um, you said, like you go, you don't keep track of who does and doesn't dispense the we medications. Don't. So, but if you have the to, like, state does, you are required to fill this out and submit this to the Oregon Health Authority, who again keeps this very. Uh, they're the only ones that have this data. So you don't. So for the compounding like record, though, do you have to like? Does the compounding record just go to the state and then you can get rid of it as far as like keeping anatomy in a pharmacy? Of you would have it as part of your prescription files because you would never discard a prescription that you've dispensed, right? I, am I not, I'm not answering this well, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just confused then like, because if you still have the prescription files like in the pharmacy, is it possible for oh, someone, someone to from dig. outside the state to come in and figure out who dispenses? I see where you're going with this. <laughs> If you adjudicated it, how often does that have really happen? Not very. Really, truly, not very. Not very. That's a good question. Um, I suppose that would be the case because you certainly keep a, a legally prescribed prescription, you know, filed. They would, uh, I, I think that, that there would be such legal ramifications that would come through because of everything we've all been through. If someone came into your pharmacy and said, let's think about this, the DEA, terrifying people to some people, right? The DEA coming in, could they require that? I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect that there would be people swooping into your pharmacy so fast to, to, to deal with that. Um, I, I think that would probably happen. It has never happened, I will tell you that. So, yeah. Yeah. I just had a question since you brought up cost. Um, yes. So since it sounds like this is not typically covered by somebody's right. insurance plan, typically, um, have there been like foundations or something like that that mm -hmm. have popped up in you know since mm -hmm. this has passed to help mm -hmm. people cover the costs? Again, Compassion and Dying, the 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 very um, focused group, and they are in states of which have this language or have language coming or whatever. Yes, I, I think that is true. Funny, I was asking Kaylee about. Um, about that, and in Kaiser Permanente, it is a covered, depending on the individual plan they have, right? Because they're within that, they're like all these layers of plans and that sort of thing. So I found that interesting. I'm like, really? Okay. Um, but again, uh, if they're self-insured, yeah, it's, it's just everything across the landscape, I would say. But for sure, there are um, financial support for those patients, because it's costly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the great presentation today. Can you You're tell welcome. us a little bit about the uh, caregiver experience in these 902 individuals that have chosen this route, and what was their experience, and maybe compare and contrast to um, mm. caregivers of patients who have died naturally? Yeah, that's a hard question. I'm probably really not in a great position to answer that. Um, um, and are you asking about the pharmacists or the nurses or? No, the caregivers of the patient. The family members. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, anecdotally, Again, talking to my pharmacist and a couple of the major prescribers, I think that generally they want peace 
They want a peaceful passing. They are so, they've been through so much trauma, usually. Trauma with this loved one. Generally, it's cancer. Again, those numbers bear out very, very. And they're generally, uh, average age 72 is a number that comes to my, that's sitting somewhere on this phone. Um, and so these are, these, are, uh, these are family members that have been through a lot of trauma, trying to save this person, going through you know, e every measure we would go through to save someone that we love medically and, and support them. And at the very end, I think at that point, you know, and again, Kaylee tells me this, we all just want peaceful passing. That is truly what, that's why this has all come about. And I think that people have been um, very grateful for a peaceful, respectful, dignified final moment of passing. That's really true. That's what we really hear over and over. And that's why, she, why this pharmacist has been so forthright about this, saying this is what this provides. Um, you know, again, to the gentleman's point back here, it's not, it's, you know, I, I just struggle with the word suicide. It's, it's, that's n not what this is. This is peaceful passing, and family members are generally so incredibly grateful for, for that. Yeah. And to follow up on that, is yeah. there any legislation that prevents research into, into um, caregiver research or assessing the, the net benefit of this type of um, right. service? Right. Um, I don't know that there's anything preventing that. I think that though, um, the protection of this data. I mean, there is, there's like a force field around this. I mean, it is, th there is an annual report put out by the Oregon Health Authority every year. It's very interesting, you know, what is here. Um, let me grab one and say, uh, here, let's do the 2011. Here's just the, the um, Oregon Public Health Division, Oregon Health Authority, Oregon's Death of Dignity Act, 13 years. Here's a report that they, that they produced. Oregon's DWD enacted late 1997, allows terminally ill, blah, blah, blah. Let's go down here. Uh, in 2010, 97 prescriptions for lethal medications were written under the provisions of Death of Dignity Act, 97 in an entire year. Compared to 95 written in 2009, up to. Of the 97 patients for whom prescriptions were written during 2010, 59 died from ingesting the medications. 59. In addition, six patients written during previous years ingested the medications and died during 2010. So they still had them, crossed over a year, and, right? And a total of 65 known 2010 DWDA deaths. This corresponds to an estimated 20.9 DWDA deaths per 10,000 deaths in Oregon. 59 physicians wrote the 97 prescriptions in 2010, with number of prescriptions per physician ranging from 1 to 11. Patient characteristics. Demographic uh, characteristics have remained relatively unchanged over the 13 years. Of the 65 patients who died under death or dignity in 2010, most, 70.8%, were over the age of 65. Ha! Look at me. Medium age was 72. Um, even though I'm in a different time zone and my head is still in Oregon. Um, as in previous years, most of the deaths in 2010 were, um, they were white, 100% were well-educated, 42.4% had at least a bachelor's degree, had cancer, 78.5%. Um, and that, again, back to somebody's question back in here, the economic component, right? The economic component. Patients who participated have different demographic characteristics and underlying causes of death other, let's see, uh, than other Oregonian. Uh, during the first 10 years, 65% were greater than 65 years of age compared to 78% of others. Um, 41 point something percent had a college degree or greater compared with 14% of other deaths. And then we go into whole, all these other things. Um, oh, this is interesting too. Uh, most patients who died in 2010 were enrolled in hospice care at the time of death, 92.6% of them. Mm -hmm. This percentage has also increased over the last 13 years. As comparison, 73.3% of patients were enrolled in hospice care at the time of death in 1998. It has absolutely skyrocketed. This whole conversation, this whole piece has really um, changed how things happen in Oregon. It really is very interesting. Um, and in 2010, as in all other prior years, most patients who died had some form of health insurance, 96.7%. Ooh, 
what they don't go on to tell us is if the health insurance paid for this. Chances are probably no. So hopefully that's useful perspective as well. Yeah. Other questions? Are we done? I, I'm keeping. I'm probably keeping you from like important classes and things, right? Looks like. Uh, well, thanks so much, Paige, uh, for oh, coming. It's a great presentation. Thank you, big you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Very nice of you. And Dean Seifert has a special gift for you. Oh, we love presents. Oh my gosh. Because when you get back to. Uh, Oregon, we'd like you yes. to be properly dressed. Oh, that's fantastic. <gasps> Can we put it on? Take a picture? Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, fun. Oh, this is fun. Thank you. That's You're lovely. Welcome. Look, I have a new family. This is great. Here, let's, most importantly, should be the logo showing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Here, we'll take a picture. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Show the logo. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Really lovely. Is it, is it the right size? Is it oh, it's right? perfect. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Here, I will take off my... Thank you in the other room. Well, good. I hope it's what you were hoping it to be. I, um, let's see here. We're going to...